Welcome back to Carib Nation. Today we're focusing on the finer arts of the Caribbean. If you were captured with the lyrics of Velma Pollard and the wit and energy of Paul Keynes Douglas, you'll definitely be engrossed by the literary work of Mr. Noel Bacchus, publicist, novelist, and historian. Take it away, David. Thank you very much, Aisha. Mr. Noel Bacchus, welcome to Carib Nation. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I saw your book on the shelf at Arawak Bookstore here in Washington, D.C. And being from Guyana, I took an immediate notice of it. <laughs> and the proprietor, Mr. Payne, Payne yes. said, are you going to be in town to do a reading? Yes. If I would like to talk to you? And I said, yes, why not? He gave me a copy of the book, and I sat down, and I began to read the book. I never put it down. Oh, really? How I only left Guyana nine years ago, so yes. a lot of the scenes that you paint in the book are familiar to me. But nevertheless, there was that grip. Yes. What prompted you to write this book? My children were born in New York City. They've never been to Guyana. My wife is American. When they were very young, as most parents do, uh, we used to read stories to them when they were going to bed. And as most children like, they want to have the same stories over and over and over. So every once in a while, I would sneak in a little story about what it was like growing up in Guyana. And they, they thought they were stories, they thought they were fairy tales. So when my eldest son was about 12, he said, Dad, why don't you write some of those fairy tales you used to tell us about Guyana? <laughs> and I said, Sebastian, those weren't fairy tales. That was my life. And he said, more reason, Dad. So I started writing. And that's how Guyana Farewell came to be. But you left Guyana 40 years ago. How were you able to recollect all these uh, images, all these scenes? What happens is that as you write, it triggers memories. And, and they come flooding back. I recall there's one scene in which I was thinking about my father. And then suddenly I remembered being on a train in Japan, traveling from Tokyo to Osaka and looking at the reflection in the window. You know how when the train is going, the glass reflects? Right. And I suddenly saw this face, which I thought was my father's, and I was stunned. And just as quickly, I realized it was my face that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And it was such an anguished moment. I mean, the tears started come down because my father was dead by then and here I was in this car on the train with only Japanese around and tears running down and I remembered this and of course I put it in the book right right so whenever I wrote when I wrote about the rainy season and I remember the rain on the roof then it was extraordinary how memories would come flooding back and sometimes I wouldn't remember something exactly, so I would call a friend or I'd call my sister or my brother and I'd say, did you recall this or did you recall that? And sometimes their recollection was quite different. Mm -hmm. Why did you title the book Guyana Fear? Well, I was trying to figure that out and I really couldn't figure it out. So <laughs> Many people have asked me that. Because for me, it is a farewell in several different levels. It's a farewell to a time and a place that really doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I grew up there in the 1930s and 40s, and many of the things that existed then, the atmosphere, it was uh, a colony, it was not an independent state, it was quite Victorian in its perspectives, it was, there were many quaint things about Guyana that people who read the book laugh about, even I laugh about. And also, I will never return to Guyana to live. So that, that also, uh, I'm 62 years old, mm -hmm. maybe I have 10 years more. And, and so, it was as fond 
a goodbye to all that. Mm -hmm. That's why I call it Guyana Farewell. Yes, interesting. Another thing that uh, really intrigued me, and which I couldn't figure out, why did you start the book at Christmas? <laughs> I started the book at Christmas because when I sat down to write, that was the first thing that came to me. Why? Why? Well, the day before, I had been listening to a record and it was, and on the record was a rendition of an old Christmas carol, um, which brought back to me a flood of memories about Christmas, and Christmas was one of the most wonderful times. So it was natural for me to start there. And I had the largest amount of immediate memories, mm -hmm. and that's why I started it. And then when I had written it, uh, the editor suggested other possibilities to start with because I wrote it in sections but I, I loved the sound of the start I loved how it sounded and so I said that's what I want in the book you teased out a number of issues the book is beautifully written thank you simple thank you. but full of images thank you and it teased out a number of issues race yes class yes. sports yes colonization yes all of these uh, wrapped up into one i think that is what makes it such a dynamic piece of literature and none of this was intentional uh -huh. i mean uh, i wrote as i felt and remembered and it's astounded me the response that people have had to it and the things they read into it that are a revelation to me mm -hmm. not necessarily intended but maybe subconsciously i thought about mm -hmm. it you wrote very movingly about your mother oh, and, yes. and, and your father yes. but especially your mother yes. and and, and uh, for me that was a celebration of guyanese and caribbean motherhood yes um talk a little bit about that what what is it that that went into you as you were putting out putting on those words i think it would be easier if i read a small passage sure go right ahead. can i do that yes uh-huh my mother was a very strong woman, as you can tell. From the, from the book, yes. there's no doubt about that. And um, my father was a civil servant, and civil servant salaries were very low. Mm -hmm. With six children, it was difficult to support them, which was why my mother started uh, making preserves, jams and jellies, to sell. And some years, she made two or three times as much as my father did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me read a little about that. By the time I became conscious of the significance of her enterprises, my mother's work had already achieved the size of a cottage industry. She was generating hundreds of jars of guava jelly neatly packaged in screw-top glass jars and attractively identified by a colorful printed label. During the periods of my mother's greatest production, the kitchen of our home was a simmer of boiling vessels and crackling coal pots. The rhythmic thwack, thwack of wood being chopped in the bottom house was often our first waking sound. A cast iron stove fueled with wood and several coal pots with charcoal were lit as early as 5 a.m. and constantly replenished throughout the day. My mother would go to the market to bargain for the guavas. They would say, Look at these guavas, missus. They're ripe and sweet. I'm going to give you a good price. To which my mother might respond, Those too green. Or, Half of them are most rotten. I go pick out the best ones for your mum. You know how they used to talk. Mm -hmm. Successful, she would return home, and we would have domestic help working with her. Sweating in the heat, they would talk and sing and complain with an occasional apprehensive aside to each other. You better stop drinking that tea and finish them bottles. Sister Vegan, fix your proper. My mother's first name was Vivian, so they used to call her Sister V. v yes. okay. My mother's return was similar to a small hurricane. A furiously ringing bicycle bell. Everybody rode bicycles. Mm. A rattle of wooden boards on the bridge. A clatter of a two-loose bicycle chain. 
was followed by her peremptory call from downstairs, summoning the nearest person to assist her in unloading her cargo. Ada? Ivy? Why don't you come quick? Woe to those passers-by in front of our house, caught in the wake of her urgent requirements. You fellow! Yes, you! Come here and help me. That was my mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were around and she needed the help, she would summon you. You obviously um, was very close to your mother. Yes. But your father, I sense there was a sort of distance. Yes. Why? Well, it, it has to do with the time. Uh, growing up in Guyana was a Victorian affair. By that, everybody was very strict. It was authoritarian. There was not a lot of show of emotion. This I'm talking about a middle class. Right. Place. And I suspect that was an emulation of the British, because you know everything was patterned on the British. And then he was a civil servant too, yes, so yes. you know authority. So it was, there was a reserve to him. I think that was also a natural reserve. And although my mother was the dominant person in the family, my father was the authority. Silent, but of authority. Yes, everybody deferred to him, and so. Even though he was seemed mild mannered, we knew that he was the authority. Mm -hmm. So it was not easy to, except when you were very small, to get a hug or a kiss. Right. As right. you got older, the reserve was more. Than mm -hmm. Your father was East Indian. Yes. And your mother was mixed. My mother was mixed. mixed. She was the great great grandchild of a Barbadian slave. Okay. And that Barbadian slave. Um, uh, one of the men she, she had children were was the, my gra great grandfather and, and then my grandfather and um, she was what they would call a high yellow slave okay. and she married a very dark man and so that's how the blend. My grandfather uh, married a Trinidadian uh, woman who was the daughter of a Jewish accountant. So there's a whole mixture there. Mix up, mix yes. up. But your mother would have been categorized as, as mixed. Uh, yes, or that's near right. black. Huh? Definitely. And uh, she was married to an Indian. Yes. Not a very fashionable thing in right. Guyana in those days. That is quite how, right. How did that impact on your household? Well, this is hearsay. But um, my father and mother met working as the lowest uh, clerks in the civil service at the uh, law courts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, as young people do, they got attracted to each other. But because he was Indian, his parents objected strenuously. My mother's, uh, my grandparents, when they learned that his parents were objecting, they in turn then objected. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> well, as young people do, when they could, they got away and met each other. Finally, both sets of parents acknowledged that this was going to happen. So they had a chaperone. My uncle was their chaperone. And eventually they got married. But it was, in those days, it was unusual, but now it isn't as much. Mm -hmm. So when you were growing up, you were what called a dogla? Or, uh, what yes, that was one of the things we were called. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's family lived in the country in Maheka. And um, uh, they would come to visit occasionally, and that gave me some introduction to Indian life. Okay. But our life generally was dominated by my grandparents on my mother's side, who live up the street from us, and were, I suppose, a middle class, very proper. Mm -hmm. And so we were more influenced by them than by Indian side. You and your siblings all went on to do well educationally. Um, you went to Queen's College, the premier boys school in Guyana at that time. What is it in the household? And I was trying to figure this out in the book. Um, and it kept coming and going back, coming and going back. Tell me, what was it that triggered this almost uh, uh, inevitable drive towards education? Um, in Guyana, in British Guyana, when the um, slaves left the plantations after the emancipation 
um, proclamation in the 1830s, they, most of them went to the towns. And then the British hired, uh, brought in people from elsewhere, mostly Indians, to work the sugar estates. The black slaves emulated the British. They saw that the British felt that education was important, and they again emulated the British. So eventually they became the people who were in the civil service at the lowest levels, and that made an enormous stress on education. And my grandparents were uh, a product of that. So that by the time my mother was bringing us, um, she was intent that we would have a good education, whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. And I was one who didn't care for it too much. M my eldest brother and my two brothers and sister were very good students, but I, re went, I resisted kicking and screaming. <laughs> but my mother was determined, uh -huh. and she wouldn't spare the rod, I can assure you that. Mm -hmm. One of the persons you celebrate in the book is Sister Jones. Oh, and I, I, I can yes. identify with Sister Jones. Oh. I mean, growing up in Boxton in yes. Guyana, yes. I have known several Sister Joneses. Oh, one Tell us a little bit about Sister Jones. Sister Jones, she was a market woman. She uh, was uneducated. She had a stall in the market in which she uh, sold fruit and vegetables. And she was not the type of person that would normally come into my family's orbit except when we went to buy uh, fruits and vegetables. But my mother was extraordinary in that she was no respecter of people standing in the community. And so she became acquainted with Sister Jones, this woman in the market cell, because she bought guavas from her. Right. And uh, it must have been that Sister Jones um, impressed her because she was so dependable. My mother respected people who promised and delivered. And Sister Jones always had guavas with my mother. Honesty. Yes. Yeah. And, and so my mother began to depend on her to do things in the market. And she her. eventually moved in and lived moved in the house. In, in she the moved her into the house at the back of our place. And Sister Joan became eventually almost an arbiter of disputes in the family. My father at first was, you know, who is this? But eventually he became a friend and she became his confidant. And I would see them talking. My father is very proper, well coiffed. Uh, and this, this, um, this woman who uneducated, not particularly well dressed or anything, but such a wonderful spirit. She would we'd come to the market and she'd put her arms around us and I mean she didn't have children, so she kind of adopted us. Right. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I loved you, her. You you, you you talked a lot about sports in the book. Oh, yes. As sports was certainly part of your yes. growing up, you and your brothers Very much. and your sister. Very in much. particular cricket. Yes. And and, and you, you oh, recounted it. some scenes oh, of it. cricket oh, and, yes. and, 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 and so forth. Yes. Was, was, was cricket, uh, in particular, and sports in general, part of the education growing cricket, up here in colonial Guyana? Cricket was the essence of sport in Guyana and the West Indies. We lived about two blocks away from um, the Guyana Cricket Club. It was called Boredom. And that's where the international matches, when uh, British or Australian or Pakistan teams came to Guyana to play at West Indies, they would play at Border. And of course, everybody listened to the broadcasts on the radio, or if you didn't have a, a ticket or you couldn't afford a ticket. Um, I remember as a boy trying to climb the trees overlooking the fence um, and being caught by my grandfather and getting a whipping <laughs> and listening to the announcers on the radio and all because all the windows were open in the houses because of the heat and all the radios were on you could go along the street and follow the cricket broadcast think of try to imagine with the baseball series going along walking along the street you couldn't hear a thing no. but because all the houses the windows were open you would hear the voices of the announcer and he runs up to deliver the ball and he makes a wonderful square cut and you'd hear the cheering oh it was wonderful who was your favorite cricketer oh frank Worrell. uh grace 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 the elegance mm -hmm. how he would move down and Square, cut the ball. It was just extraordinary. Do you yearn for those days today? I mean, now we get cricket on the television and so forth, but still it's not a real thing. 
there is a strong nostalgia that comes on me every once in a while um, for that pastime. We would, I remember my friends would come by and my mother would have packed a hamper with sandwiches, cut, you know, um, the sandwiches, the bread would be cut in squares Squid and the crust would be taken off mm -hmm. and would be wrapped in napkins and you would take it to the cricket and you would open this hamper with the napkins, the cloth napkins, and you eat the sandwiches and watch the cricket and drink tea. Mm -hmm. It was a distant time. It was wonderful, but that was the past. Mm -hmm. my, my boys who were American and growing up here uh, often said to me, Dad, you were kind of weird, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> You're just teasing me. Your family traveled a lot. You traveled yes. from Georgetown as far as Skeldon. Oh, I mean, yes. You know, Guyanese, even today, Yes. Didn't. they will have to become adults before they will yes. travel from Georgetown to Skeldon. Yes. And obviously, you traveled a lot. And so you, you got a sense to, yes. to take in the scenery yes. in, in, in Guyana. Yes. And obviously, that impressed you tremendously because oh. throughout the book, you yes, interject. And, yes. and, and you mentioned names of villages. Yes. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about how, how that shaped your own sense of being. Um, my mother was in was very religious and she belonged to a church and they had churches all over the country, small churches. And we had friends in Skeldon, which is on the Quarantine River. Right on the border with, with Suriname. Suriname. And in August, she would take us for two weeks to stay with a friend. And it was a long trip because in those days there was still a train. And it was a little train on a narrow gauge track with, you know, um, uh, smoke Smoke, Black yes, smoke yes, on it. Yes. And it would go along and stop at all these little villages all along the way. And people would come to the windows and you would lean out the windows and they'd be selling you fruits and vegetables and Indian things like palauri and patties and so on. And then after traveling maybe half the day and the train rocketing along and you'd look out through the windows and you'd see the cane fields spread out green and creeks and you'd see men pushing bullocks pulling the cane or cutting the cane and you would smell you know the, the smoke from the train and the train would mm -hmm. oh it was wonderful and then we'd come to the ferry and you'd get off the train and you'd get on this ferry and you would go across the ferry and the next morning we would take the bus and the bus would have all these baggage piled on top of these wooden buses, you know, with slats for the seats and these women would bring their chickens and their market baskets and they would pile them into the train and we'd set off on this road and heading for Skeleton. Oh, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've been away from Guyana 40 years, yes. 41 years to be precise, because you left in 1955. Five, right. It's um, uh, two-thirds of your life exactly. outside That's of right. Guyana. That's right. Yet you write these beautiful things, and you remember Guyana with a certain kind of fondness. Yes. But you said just now that you wouldn't go back. I didn't say I wouldn't go back. I said it's unlikely that I'll go back, because at 62, with two boys, who one in graduate school and one in college and all the, the concerns and probably grandchildren mm -hmm. coming and a business to run it's it's difficult it's, to do it it's it's difficult yes but uh, and and i think also i'm afraid that when i get back it will be so different that it will it will distress me yes and it probably isn't I'm so sure the rhythms are the same. I'm sure many of the things I portray are the same. But you like to hold on to a picture. Right, right. And I think that's, that more than anything else is what... Um, mm -hmm. Your motivation to write this book, that is your kids, Yes. is very important yes. because there are old generations of uh, Caribbean yes. children being yes. born here yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. And who are hungry yes. for an understanding, a cultural connection yes. with the Caribbean, with Guyana. Yes. And I think that's the function of this book. One of the loveliest things that has happened as a result of this book, because remember, I had a very narrow focus. I was writing it specifically for my sons. Right. But uh, it's been extraordinary. I get letters from young people, old people. I got a letter from a man who left Guyana in 1934 and said in his letter, I left Guyana when the year you were born. And um, it just brings back the most wonderful memories. A young lady 
she must be 25, stopped me on the street and said, are you Noel Bacchus who wrote Guyana Farewell? And I said, yes. She said, you know, I've never been to Guyana, but my parents were there. And you made me feel as if I was there. Mm -hmm. So I, I was stunned. Sense of satisfaction. And I, it just, I was just stunned. You, you <laughs> were. Do you plan to do a part two? I doubt it. This was hard, hard work. <laughs> this was very hard work. Uh -huh. I don't know. People have asked me that. And it was hard work. I, I know. Any parting words you want to tell the audience? If you, whoever you are listening here, Guyanese, Caribbean, or any others, Try to remember things about your childhood and write them down for your children. It's be, it would be a wonderful legacy for him. Write it down. You too. Yeah, write it down. I most certainly will. The book is Guyana of Farewell, written by Noel Bacchus. It's uh, a book that I recommend very highly to all Guyanese, all Caribbean uh, people, because it's a book that takes you into the bowels of Guyana, the bowels of our Caribbean existence. And it's interesting that it's written by someone who has been here for yes. over 40 years. Yes. So it gives a perspective that many of us uh, can identify with. Yes. You know, because Caribbean people come here yes. and um, we always intend to go back right. home. We always intend to go back right. home and we never yes. uh, make it back. But with the old new globalization yes. and the information, highway and so on, yes. the world becomes smaller. a smaller place. Yes. And when we read books like this, yes. then we can reconnect with our childhood, yes. reconnect with our culture yes. and uh, really understand who we are. This book goes a long way yes. towards dealing with the whole question of our identity yes. as a people. Well, we've come to the end of yet another edition of Carib Nation. We hope you've enjoyed our special presentation with folklore comedian Paul Keynes Douglas, poet Velma Pollard, and novelist Noah Bacchus. Please join us next time when we'll turn the spotlight on yet another facet of Caribbean life. I'm Aisha London. See you next time.